Welcome to the Book Bungalow's special virtual presentation, A History of Time Travel in Science Fiction with Dr. Lisa Yazik, Regents Professor of Science Fiction Studies at Georgia Tech. My name is Tanya Mills, and I'm the owner and manager of the Book Bungalow in St. George, Utah. As Southern Utah's only independent bookstore offering all new books and a full range of events, we're continuing to do our events virtually for now, but uh, through July anyway, but we hope to open up again to in-person events shortly thereafter. And that's not to say that we won't hold virtual events in the future because one of the few positive developments that came out of this pandemic was that bookstores could suddenly get access to authors from across the country and even around the world. We had an event the other day with someone in England uh, so in future, we'll be doing a mix of live and virtual events. In fact, this next week, we are going to do a virtual book launch for Sarah Flannery Murphy's Girl One. Oh, and you're sharing Lisa's screen right now, so I don't know if you can see. You can see it in front of my face. It's a, a speculative feminist thriller that's also a riveting exploration of creation involving genetics about a girl conceived without male DNA. Then next Saturday, because Sarah happens to live in Southern Utah, she'll be doing a live book signing on our front porch. So I'm including a link in the chat box to register for her virtual launch in case that's of interest to any of you. I have to admit that I am currently out of store copies of H.G. Wells's classic science fiction novel, The Time Machine. But Dr. Yazik and I thought it would be a great time to delve into the history of time travel on this, the 126th anniversary of the novel's initial publication. A special edition of the book featuring an introduction by Dr. Yazik, as you call her Lisa, uh, as well as other books by her are available for order from our store's website. I've posted that link in the chat box with other links that might be of interest, uh, but all of you who are registered will receive, do I need to admit anyone else? Um, how can I, waiting room. Well, I'm not seeing how I can admit them. It says there's two in the waiting room. Oh, well, um, where was I? All of you who registered will receive a follow-up email with these links again, as well as the YouTube link to the recording of today's presentation as soon as the video posts on our channel. And finally, as a housekeeping note, let me point out that our store policy forbids harassment of any kind. So anyone who posts or says anything that could be deemed as harassment will be removed from the event, but I doubt that will happen. I haven't had it happen yet. Lisa researches and teaches science fiction as a global language crossing centuries, continents, and cultures in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication at Georgia Tech. She's particularly interested in issues of gender, race, and tech science and technology in science fiction across media, as well as the recovery of lost voices in science fiction history and the discovery of new voices from around the globe. Her books include The Self-Wired, Technology and Subjectivity in Contemporary American Narrative, Galactic Suburbia, Recovering Women's Science Fiction, which we're out of copies of too. Sisters of Tomorrow, the first women of science fiction. We do have a copy of The Future is Female, 25 classic science fiction stories by women from pulp pioneers to Ursula K. Le Guin, and literary Afrofuturism in the 21st century. In fact, we're gonna be hosting a panel discussion of that topic next month on June 22nd, moderated by her and her co-author, Isaiah Lavender. Uh, I'll be sure and include information on that event, as well as the Girl One launch in our follow-up email. Her ideas about science fiction as the premier story form of modernity have been featured in the Washington Post, Food and Wine Magazine, and USA Today, and on the AMC miniseries, James Cameron's story of science fiction, and there's a book out about that too that she's in. A past president of the Science Fiction Research Association, 
Yazik currently serves as an editor for the Library of America and as a juror for the John W. Campbell and U.G. Foster Science Fiction Awards. She received her BA in English from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and her MA and PhD degrees also in English from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Um, I'll now turn the time and the screen, well, she's already got the screen, over to Dr. Yazik. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the chat box. And if time permits, we'll she will try to respond following her presentation. Lisa, the time is yours, go ahead. All right, thank you so much, Tanya, um, for having me here. It's great to be working with you and with the book bungalow again. And thanks to everyone for taking time out of your Memorial Day weekend to come and hang out and learn about uh, the history of time travel. If nothing else, I hope to leave you with some fantastic cocktail party conversation today. Uh, finally, I wanna give a shout out to all my Georgia Tech students who are here. Uh, thanks so much again for coming and supporting. And if you do indeed order a book, I know we're doing online class, but if you are um, on campus this summer and certainly this fall, we can find ways for me to get a copy of your book and write a note to you in it. Uh, and that would be our first chance to meet face to face, which could be really fun. All right. So uh, once so now that I've think, thought, I think I think everyone here is here, hopefully. Um, why don't we get started and talk about uh, the history of time travel? So I don't have to tell you anything about myself. Tanya did a fantastic job. We're gonna just jump right in. I'm gonna take you through about uh, 2000 years of history in I think 40 minutes, and then we will indeed hopefully have some time for questions. And if not, we'll figure out a way right to go back in time or stretch time or dilate it um, and, and make that happen. Okay, great. Okay. So why time travel in science fiction and why the time machine? You know, I was saying uh, to Tanya, and I think we ended up putting this on the flyer for the event, that one of the only good things about 2020 was that it marked the 125th anniversary of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, which is, as many of you know, the iconic story that ushered in both modern science fiction storytelling and gave us one of science fiction's most enduring images, the time machine itself. Now, later in life, Wells was very quick to dismiss the time machine and a lot of his early science fiction as sensational writing with a dash of social theory. And while it's true that the evolutionary theory guiding Wells's novel often does take a back seat to the hero's scientific and romantic adventures in time and space, the time machine also asks us to confront philosophical issues, including the tension between free will and predestination, the relationship between memory and identity, and the inevitability of love, loss, and death. And this is why we love the time machine. And frankly, I think why we love all time travel stories. They let us imagine that we can break free from the grip of linear time and better understand the experience of humanity itself. All right. Now, a lot of people have asked me, um, how, how long have we been telling stories about time travel? And the answer is, honestly, stories about time travel seem to be literally as old as culture itself. We can go back to uh, Indian epics and Japanese myths and find uh, stories about time dilation, stories about humans who spend time in the heavens, and then they return to Earth um, thinking that they've only been in the heavens maybe for a few hours, at best a few days. But then, of course, when they return to Earth, uh, hundreds, if not thousands of years have passed. And if you wanna look at some great ancient time dilation stories, you might look at the Mahabharata and in particular, you wanna look at King Kakudmi's story. And that's from about 400 BCE. And then in Japanese myth, you wanna look at the story of Hiroshima Taro, which is from the eighth century CE. So you get these really early time dilation stories and then time travel stories start to show up again in the late 1700s and the early 1800s with the rise of modern science and technology, suddenly we have some sort of new ways to tell these stories and some new spins to put on these very, very old tales. So some of the earliest stories uh, start speculating from maybe what we call biological perspective. So you might think for instance about uh, Rip Washington Irving's Rip Van Winkle in which a man travels through time by prolonged sleep. And that's a story from 1819. Um, we also get from the 1800s tales in which travelers move through times by dreams or even one-off accidents. And these are often called time slip stories. 
And two really famous ones that probably a lot of you already know are Charles Dickinson's A Christmas Carol and Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So we start to see more and more time travel stories over the course of the 1800s. And then suddenly at the very end of the 1800s, around 1880, there's a real boom. And all of a sudden there are literally dozens of people writing these kinds of stories. Um, why does this happen at this time? I think there's a couple different reasons. Uh, the big one, of course, is that industrial expansion demanded the coordination of train and ship schedules. All of a sudden, we were producing lots of materials, and those materials had to be taken across vast distances. And if people didn't coordinate time in the same way, you would run the risk of really serious uh, train yard and shipyard accidents with boats running into each other. Or conversely, you would have real shortages because things didn't show up uh, in a timely fashion. So all of this basically culminated in the Time Conference of 1884, where delegates from 26 different countries met in Washington, DC to standardize the Earth's geographical coordinates and the length of the day. Now, optimism about the human ability to control time all of a sudden then is getting reflected in these stories about machines that literally move us through time. And this is the first time in recorded history we really see time machine stories. Not surprisingly, a lot of the earliest time machine stories actually revolve around clocks, such as Edward Page Mitchell's The Clock That Went Backward from 1881 and Lewis Carroll's Sylvie and Bruno from 1889. Other stories imagine that we might travel through time the way we travel through space in some sort of vehicle like a ship. And you see that in a Spanish story by Enrique Gaspar called The Time Ship from 1887. But of course, the most famous machine that's going to move people through time and space is H.G. Wells' Time Machine from 1895. And we're gonna come back to that in just a minute. Okay, now science fiction became a distinct popular genre with its own authors and editors and readers and writers and fans and critics in the early to sort of mid 20th century. And what you're going to see is that time travel stays one of the really favored themes in science fiction throughout that period. Now, artists in this era are gonna use time travel stories for a lot of different purposes. Some are going to tell future histories of technology and society to get us excited about the things we might develop. Others are just going to give us exotic tours of faraway times and places because that's fun to read. And some people are even gonna to try to provide an education on the science of time travel itself. Now, like their predecessors, early science fiction authors touch on issues of free will versus predetermination. And this is often expressed through stories about what scientists in the 1960s would eventually call the butterfly effect. One of the very first stories that explores what we now call the, and if you don't know what the butterfly effect is, that's where something happens that seems really insignificant, like a butterfly flaps its wings, and then a few days later, there's a tsunami on the other side of the world. And we don't know exactly what the connection is, but we know that somehow there's a connection between those. Time travel stories explore that through space, or time, obviously, rather than space. So one of the first really famous ones is Jack Williamson's Legion of Time from 1938 where one man's decision to pick up either a magnet or a pebble results in two very different futures for humanity. And here's a fun fact, science fiction students especially, because this is gonna come up eventually this semester, the protagonist of this novel is named John Barr. And if you read or watch science fiction, especially time travel stories, you'll often hear people talk about John Barr points. And the John Barr point is the point in a history where someone makes a choice and the world's history will diverge in two very different ways. And that goes all the way back to Legion of Time, to that idea of the John Barr point. So there's the first cocktail party nugget for you for today. Maybe not the first, but perhaps one of them, we'll see. All right, um, so we get a story like that. Probably the most famous uh, butterfly effect story is Ray Bradbury's A Sound of Thunder from 1952, in which stepping on a prehistoric butterfly transforms the contemporary United States into an illiterate and fascist dystopia. That is not what happens in the movie, interestingly. So watch the movie where you get a very different, weird future. I'm not gonna tell you about it. You have to go see it for yourself. All right, 
Now, classic uh, science fiction authors also enjoyed the challenge of trying to logically resolve the time paradoxes that might arise when humans begin to tinker with history. This is sometimes called, uh, it often culminates in a story that's called the grandfather paradox, which asks, what if I went back in time and changed a single event such as killing my grandfather? Would I exist? What would the world look like, et cetera, right? So again, here's a few early examples of this story uh, that you may or may not know. One is Fritz Lieber's Try to Change the Past from 1958, which postulates a law of the conservation of reality. Um, and that makes history resistant to change. Another great example is Robert Heinlein's All You Zombies, ooh, which I'm not gonna tell you the plot of because my students are gonna be reading that later this semester and I don't wanna ruin the surprise for you. Just suffice to say that uh, it is a dizzying tale of a time cop who is going to travel through multiple points in history um, to essentially recruit himself into the time uh, cop uh, order. And me telling you that tells you zero about the story, let me just tell you. Uh, for those of you who, I see Tanya is laughing, you know this story, I assume. For those of you who prefer a visual version of it, I would check out Ethan Hawke's pre uh, Predestination, which is the same movie. And one of the few times that honestly, I think a movie does just as good as uh, the print story at telling uh, the story. Oh, I don't know if you think that. In fact, I'm gonna even go out on a limb and say, I think Predestination solves one of the actual problems in the Heinlein story and that maybe it's a tiny bit better for that. Um, I would love to talk about it more, but again, we are not gonna talk about details because I don't want my students to uh, not be surprised and have the fun of reading that particular story. Uh, the one thing that I will note that's really interesting in a lot of in these stories, in time cop stories, it's okay to change the past. Um, we often tend to think that time travel stories are always about, oh, we can never change the past. And that is often true in butterfly effect stories. Butterfly effect stories do tend to be very negative, but time cop stories actually aren't. Usually in a time cop story, it's either, you know, it's okay to change the past, um, either because it's going to do some sort of greater good in the future or because time is pretty malleable and it's hard to do much damage to it anyway. Um, often, in fact, uh, and this is, comes out of 1950s science fiction, the only penalty for time travel is having a really bad headache after it all, because when you're trying to think through the logic of what's just happened, and it's almost impossible. And some of you uh, might remember that there's a Star Trek Next Generation that I think involves time travel. And uh, I think it's Beverly Crusher figures it out because she gets a really bad headache. So showing you how built baked in that joke is into science fiction history. Okay, so now, obviously, time travel stories continue to be really popular in the present. And in fact, I think they've become, if anything, more and more popular since the 1960s and 70s. And that's because time travel stories allow us to rethink the past, the present, and the future. And that's something that we've been doing a lot, both in the United States and throughout the world at large, I think, in the last 50 or 60 years. So as some of you already know, the 1960s and 70s was often called the new wave of science fiction. And this was an era that was where science fiction was marked by an increasingly sophisticated literary style, uh, increased interest in politics, and an explosion of new voices in science fiction, many of whom turned to time travel stories as a way to do social and political commentary. Also to still have fun, believe me, we're still having a good time with our stories. Um, one thing that's really interesting that happens in this period is that the number of women in science fiction doubles. We go from about 15% of the community being women to 30%. And women are very quick to adapt the story as a way to stake claims for women in the future imaginary. So for instance, Marge Piercy's Women on the Edge of Time and James Cameron's two Terminator films, uh, both of which were heavily influenced by his then wife, Gail King, um, are stories about everyday women who encounter time travelers and realize that they, as everyday human women, have the power to make choices that will make a future, a, the future a better place for all. And some of you might remember, there's a famous scene in the second Terminator movie when Sarah O'Connor uh, carves the words no fate into a table. And it's the moment when she starts to realize uh, that she doesn't have to play by the rules everyone's been telling her she has to play by, that time is much more malleable and she has a lot more power than she thought, right? 
Um, this period also sees a new generation of indigenous and African-American authors begin to publish time travel stories. And these stories are gonna represent history in new ways. So while women are often staking claims for themselves in the future, uh, authors of color are asking us to rethink the past as they're staking claims for themselves in the past. Uh, two really awesome stories that everyone should go read just because they're super great stories under any set of circumstances. Uh, but that really reflect this new trend uh, from the 70s are Gerald Visner's Custer on the Slipstream, in which a modern bureaucrat becomes unstuck in time and realizes he is the reincarnation of General Custer. Another amazing story, of course, that many of you will already know is Octavia E. Butler's Kindred from 1979, which is literally, or not literally, but very much a variant on, and I think even a kind of reversal of the grandfather paradox. It's a story about a modern African-American woman who finds herself transported back in time to antebellum Maryland, where she has to help a young, violent white slave owner rape her free black ancestor in order to ensure that her own family line will start. Um, it's obviously a really uh, tough story and a beautiful story. And again, something everyone should totally check out. And if you're not completely oriented to the print word, I would strongly recommend that you check out the graphic novel of Kindred by Damian Duffy and John Jennings. It is a beautiful, marvelous piece of work. Now, I know this is making it sound like there's nothing but super heaviness in contemporary science fiction. Um, and while there is indeed, there are a lot of stories that follow H.G. Wells and that use time travel to make serious points about science and society, time travel stories always remain fun as well. Whether it's the fun of trying to figure out how it is that your very serious heroes got into and heroines get into these very serious dilemmas, or whether you're trying to figure out how to pass your high school final exam, as in Bill and Ted, right? Um, time travel, it's funny. And, and I don't want to forget that fact. And in fact, I think really want to want to celebrate that. And this is something else we see in the 70s and 80s and 90s is an explosion of time travel comedies across media. Okay, thanks. Um, cool. So for instance, one of the most famous uh, print ver uh, versions of this uh, that, that get written get written in the 1970s is Spider Robinson's Callahan's Cross Time Saloon series. And this was a series that Robinson wrote from 1977 until 2003. And it's, uh, they're set, it's set in a bar for time travelers. And as people come through, they pool their diverse experiences to help newcomers solve unusual problems. Um, I think it's a very charming series and one that has very much, it evolves over time. You can really see how Spider Robinson's own thinking uh, changes over time in the series. It's, it's, it's really quite, quite charming and fun. So uh, other fun science fiction uh, time travel comedies, of course, include Back to the Future from 1985, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure from 1989 through all of the sequels, including the most recent one that I, I really liked it. I thought that the Bill and Ted daughters were, were even more Bill and Ted than Bill and Ted. So fantastic for them. And then of course, Groundhog Day from 1993. These are all movies that celebrated the possibility that average people could travel to the past make and then correct a variety of mistakes and in doing so change future for the better. So what we're seeing is really the same theme, whether it's a serious story or a comedy story, but really this, this belief that everyday people have the opportunity to change the world. And it makes sense. This is an era when people really were changing the world, uh, just as we're starting to really do again today, I think. Not surprisingly, we continue to see science fiction time travel uh, comedies today with web series such as Control, that's actually from 2009, it's a little bit older, but it's a really fun comedy in which a hapless office worker uses his computer keyboard to undo past events. And then the BBC series Time Wasters, which I haven't had a chance to see yet, it's just come out recently. And in fact, I think they may be shooting um, a current season now, but it's a really cool, everything I've read about it sounds really exciting. Um, and it's a story about a modern R&B band that keep getting flung back in time to periods of history when there are critical divergences help happening in music. And they are there to help witness and recover the history of people of color as they've helped build music in um, Europe and throughout the West and throughout the world. So it's really cool because as far as I can tell, it's one of the first time travel comedies featuring people of color. You tend to get, the most of the comedies tend to be around white people. So it's really nice to start to see uh, this diversifying. I think a hot tub time machine 
actually has a fairly diverse cast as well um, and is clearly a comedy as its title might suggest. I'm sorry I didn't put that on there. Hot Tub Time Machine, it's another really good comedy. All right, another strain of time travel stories that we see in contemporary uh, fiction and filmmaking are stories that remind us that time travel is still really complicated, uh, whether it's in its heroic mode or in its comedic mode. Um, these are really complicated stories. And what not surprisingly, I think we're increasingly seeing are artists and authors who are exploring both the promises and perils of temporal displacement all at once. So uh, this begins in the late 80s and early 90s with Dan Simmons's Hyperion series, which is a, a really cool retelling of the Canterbury Tales. It's a time travel story sort of filtered through yeah, the, the, the Canterbury Tales frame, marvelous, very cool. And then Connie Willis's Blackout in All Clear Diptych from 2010, which um, examines how people find meaning, it, it, both these series really examine how people find new meaning in lives that have been shattered by mysterious intrusions from an unknowable future. So in these stories, time travel is happening, uh, but not actually to our main characters. They're, they're uh, experiencing the effects of time travel as other people are trying, coming to their time. So really, I mean, that's a cool what if, right? What if you're not the time traveler, but the person who's visited by the time traveler? What does that do to your world? And it's not always a good answer. Other movies that suggest time travel is really complicated include Primer from 2004, Looper from 2012, and Interstellar from 2014. Um, and all of these movies, although they take very different angles, some more scientific uh, than others, um, they all really are uh, uh, organized around uh, the question of whether or not the benefits of time travel would ever outweigh the toll that such travel might take on individuals and their loved ones. And I think we maybe see that most clearly in Interstellar, but it's certainly there in all of these stories. It's also in video games where we're going to see these really complex narratives that want to explore why we might and why we might not want to time travel. We see this in both best-selling video games, such as The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask from 2000, where players have to solve a specific but non-linear sequence of puzzles before the moon crashes into the game world and resets time. And also in indie offerings such as Braid, and this is a game from 2008, um, Georgia Tech students, you might like this one if you don't know it. All of you might like it actually. Um, and this is a game where players manipulate the flow of time to solve puzzles that will save a princess from a monster while uncovering the main character's surprising motives for taking on this quest in the first place. Hmm. All right. Now, obviously we started this talk by thinking about H.G. Wells and how Wells is very much the father of all these different modern variants of science fiction, whether it's a butterfly effect story, a time cop story, time paradox story, uh, comedy, et cetera, what have you, right? A tragedy, et cetera. Um, and it's important to think about Wells because like I said, he really gave us this iconography and the ways that we currently think about time travel. And what's really interesting about Wells is that he took a story type that was basically magical and mythical up until that time. And he said, time travel doesn't belong to the realm of gods, it belongs to the realm of the people, right? And he made time travel something that people could do for themselves in theory, right? That any anyone with enough smarts could like tinker together a time travel machine and then go mess with history in some sometimes very disturbing ways, right? Um, and in particular, as many of you know, Wells literally made his career on his time travel stories. He was not a very well-known author prior to um, those stories, but his very first publication was a short piece called The Chronic Argonaut from 1888, and he sold that to his college newspaper. He published it in his college newspaper, and basically The Chronic Argonaut is the first draft of The Time Machine. And then The Time Machine, which was one of Wells' first novels in 1895, is literally the book that made him famous, that put him on the map. So like I said, Wells uh, wasn't the first person to tell a time travel story or even the first person to imagine we would use machines to navigate time. But we remember him because he was the first to figure out that the best science fiction is written around one fantastic element and that you keep everything else real. So what Wells did for us is he figured out a way to make time travel plausible. 
And as the students in my class will know, we've been talking about plausibility a lot, right? That this is the one of the key things that distinguishes science fiction from fantasy. Could it happen? Would it, could that plausibly happen, given what we currently know to be scientifically or socially true about our own world, right? And that's really a trick you got to work on with time travel, because time travel doesn't feel very plausible to us. It really still does feel like the realm of magic and the realm of gods, right? But Wells figured out ways to make time travel entertaining and plausible all at once, right? So one of the big things, of course, that Wells did was that he makes time travel plausible by talking about it in reference to um, the real sciences that really fascinated Victorians at that time, new theories of time and space, new theories of physical and social evolution, and even new theories of mathematics. And for those of you who don't remember it, I invite you to go back through the time machine. There is a lot of science. You get a lot of professor exposition, literally in this case, pulling out his pipe and lighting it, and then spending quite a bit of time telling you the science behind the time travel, um, right? And what Wells said would have called this is it's a little bit of a misdirection. His, his character talks about all these different sciences and technologies, but none of them really entirely have to do with time travel exactly, but he builds up this air of plausibility that they somehow fit together. He called this, Wells called this scientific prattle. Many of us today know it as techno babble because that's the word we use in Star Trek, but it's the same thing. So that's something else that Wells did. And I think it's another reason that we're really drawn to his time travel stories is he's one of the first people to figure out how you deploy techno babble successfully. All right. Um, other things that Wells does is when you reread both the short story and the novel, is it's interesting to see how much he makes time the time machine itself plausible um, through these very vague but tantalizing descriptions of the object. No one ever actually describes what the time machine looks like in its entirety. Instead, it's almost like a, a modernist collage. You get glimpses of it from different angles instead. Um, but those glimpses are tantalizing and they feel plausible because they're extrapolated from bicycles and, and automobiles, right? Which would have been some of two of the sexiest new uh, modes of transportation in that day. So there's all this talk of saddles and levers and knobs. And this gets combined, interestingly, with very precise descriptions of what the time traveler sees while he's traveling. This is actually where we get the most detail. It's not in the time machine itself. It's in the descriptions of what the traveler sees while he's traveling through time. And those descriptions are extrapolated from kinetoscopes and early films, right? And Wells was absolutely fascinated with those. And this is a cool fact I learned um, while I was putting together this talk. In fact, Wells did such a great job apparently extrapolating from kinetoscopes and using um, these sort of new flows of images to describe time that filmmakers invited him to come to their studios and help them think about how to represent time in film. And so you get this really interesting back and forth that he's learning from the early, early filmmakers and uh, film illusionists, and then they too wanted to learn from him. And I think that that's a really kind of neat feedback. And again, shows you how plugged in he really was to his moment. Um, and in fact, it turns out some of the very first uh, modern film studios were built based on things that Wells and these film directors were collaborating on and thinking about and thinking about what you would need in a dedicated film studio. Finally, and I thought this is really cool too, is that in both the short story and the uh, novel, Wells builds the plausibility of his time travelers by creating characters who are based on media representations of the most famous scientist of the 1800s, Thomas Elva Edison. And what's interesting is that Edison had a really uh, mixed reputation in his own time. And that was very much reflected in the way he was represented in the media. Um, sometimes uh, he was represented in the ways that we know Edison as Edison, the heroic problem solver, the sort of the person who literally sheds light on America, right? Uh, who can create anything, who can tinker anything together. At that time though, when Edison was doing his work, a lot of people were very resistant to it and skeptical that he represented a sort of headlong rush into techno-scientific modernity that could be downright dangerous. And a lot of people and a lot of journalists actually represented him using Mary Shelley's trope of the mad scientist 
And that's actually where the phrase, the Wizard of Menlo Park came from. It was not meant to be a compliment when it was first created. It was to represent the threat that Edison represented to rural New Jersey and the sort of rural base of America as a whole. So I think it's really interesting um, that just as, so Edison was represented at this, you know, oh, at the same time, it wasn't like there was one representation than the other. It just really depended on who was talking about him and to what ends. So you had these representations of him that coexisted. And Wells draws on the idea of Edison as the mad wizard in his short story, and then Edison as the heroic genius in his novel. So when you read the Chronic Argonauts, you'll be really struck by how much um, the mad scientist he's described actually is looking like Victor Frankenstein. He's pale, he's withdrawn, he has the dark hair, he's all by himself, classic gothy mad scientist. But then he's very much described in the same ways as the Wizard of Menlo Park. In fact, he literally, the first thing that he does uh, before he builds the time machine is he electrifies his house, he puts a uh, lighting everywhere. And it gives the villagers like a collective heart attack and then no one likes them and it all goes downhill from there. Um, so, the, and, and it's really Gothic. If you've never read the Chronic Argonauts, it's a very weird Gothic story. And it's actually gets, it's a time loop story. Um, and it's, it's way more of a kind of ghost story than I had thought it would be. It's pretty cool. All right. Now the time traveler, the novel is, as we all know, uh, definitely written more in a sort of heroic uh, strain. And in this case, the time traveler who suddenly becomes no longer a pale, uh, dark haired foreigner is suddenly a blonde, happy, healthy, ruddish British gentleman, right? And a gentleman tinkerer, right? So, uh, and becomes very much uh, the, the, uh, the British version of Tom Edison as a problem solver. And when Wells creates that particular time traveler, he's giving us one of science fiction's very first heroic scientists, right? Mary Shelley, all the way back in 1818 with Frankenstein, gave us our first mad scientist, our, our really classic one, right, that we still use today. But the heroic scientist doesn't really show up in full-blown form until Wells gets his hands on the genre. Um, you have a version in Verne, Jules Verne, of course, you have the creative engineer, right? A man who can tinker together any kind of machine. But what's really cool about the time traveler isn't just that he tinkers, but he theorizes. And he has big theories about time and space and action and things like that, right? And um, for those of you who have read the novel recently, you may remember that things don't quite go the way the time traveler hopes they're going to go. And it's kind of his fault things don't go quite the way they're going to go. Um, but he comes back to our present and makes this declaration that even though he doesn't know if he can go back and sort of fix the problems of time and space, he's gonna go do it anyway, because it doesn't matter if he wins, it's the attempt that counts. And that is the heart of science fiction, my friends. Not, oh, I can make the thing that saves the day, but uh, I can try it. And that's the attempt, right? That really matters. And that is again, I think one of the reasons we really love the time machine is not just because of the cool machines or the amazing like, love story that spans thousands of years in time and space, but that ultimately it's a story that says, even when the odds are against us, we keep going and we try. And I think that's pretty cool. And that takes us everyone to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, what I do have here for people who are interested is a list of recommended time travel texts. I could think of um, so many things I wanted to talk about with you that I didn't get a chance to. So I've put them in here for you and I have tried to branch out and give you stories from all over the world because that's one thing I didn't get a chance to talk with you about. I really focused on Anglophone stories, but we are seeing time travel stories all over the world, as you might expect. Everyone likes a good time travel story for sure. Uh, all right, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> and uh, believe me, I will be sending you the link to the YouTube recording so that you can pause it on this and write down, copy her list. This is tremendous. Um, maybe you could stop sharing your screen for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions in the chat. Um, chat. I put my links. Oh, Carlos asks, could you comment on the recent movie Tenet? Does it fit any of the tropes? Okay, so first of all, uh, Dr. Morbius 
a mighty Krell machine is a mighty machine, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And don't forget about those monsters from the it. Um, just as bad as any pesky butter prehistoric butterfly, if you ask me. Um, Carlos, you know, thank you. This is a great question. And I'm so embarrassed because I have not seen Tenet. So we are gonna do what professors always do when they are in a corner and have been asked something that they don't have an answer to. Now I'm gonna turn it around to you. Based on what we've been talking about here today or what I've been talking about so far, what do you think? Does it fit like any of these story types I've talked about or does it seem like something new is happening? Because there oh, might be, and anyone, all of you jump in, anyone who's seen yeah. Tenet or anyone who wants to pretend they have. Go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to answer her question. I haven't seen it either. Hello. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. hi, Carlos. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So yeah, it's uh, it, I just saw it very recently, and it's uh, mm -hmm. they have they spend a lot of time trying to explain the their mechanism of time travel, which is negative entropy and all that, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought was original, but a little too confusing the way it got done in film, as usual. Uh, but uh, but I think I, I don't know. I mean, it was the the typical hero trying to save the world. They realized that they're actually I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but you know the yeah. main protagonist yeah. is a time traveler as well. Um, so anyway, I I just thought it it was kind of a new take on 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 time travel or a mechanism of time travel that hadn't been tried yet or that I hadn't run into yet. Oh yeah, no, I've never heard of using negative entropy, but I love it. That's really great, right? And it sounds cool. I mean, it's already puts us firmly in the land of scientific prattle and techno babble just right there, right? Like, and it sounds plausible because we all know what entropy is. Um, the idea of negative entropy actually makes zero sense. I can see why it gave you a headache to think about it. I mean, maybe it makes sense in a way I can't think of, but I, I don't know, I'm not getting that either. Um, yeah, not but it sounds like it's right. It's a time cop movie. Yep. I'm looking up the, mm -hmm, right. Yes. So I'm looking up the uh, plot summary right now, which is the other thing we do when we don't know, <laughs> don't necessarily know what the, the story is, but right. It's, it is a time cop story. And um, right. So a single, a secret agent is given a single word as his weapon and sent to prevent the onset of world war three. He must uh, travel through time and bend the laws of nature in order to be successful on his mission. Oh, I like the bending the laws of nature part. I feel like that's cool. And you know what? That feels to me kind of like where Interstellar wanted to play as well, right? Because Interstellar really wants to think about the way the laws of nature, in particular light, the way light literally bends as it travels around uh, uh, black holes, right? Because that's the mechanism that they use there is time dilation. So, you know, I can see where it sounds like the, the I, Carlos, did you see Interstellar? Does it seem like there's a similar vibe there? Yeah, and they're both, I mean, they're both they're from both Christopher, Christopher Nolan. Nolan. But yeah. Um, Interstellar, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, you know, time travel in space, but it, it's less about time travel in a sense. It's more about relativity and all that. This right. one is definitely a time travel, time cop movie, as you're describing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I can, I can see the connection for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it seems to me like whereas Interstellar was him doing really the science side of science fiction, like really playing with how can we use science to drive this plot, right? And we even know, right, that they brought on a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Kip Thorne, onto Interstellar, and then that Thorne actually made real scientific discoveries while helping with Interstellar. So, because Hollywood has better computing power than his college does, <laughs> which is crazy, um, but interesting, right? And someone says, yep, right? Um, and but Jeffrey, yeah, and it sounds like, oh, sorry, that Tenet, right, is playing with the fiction side of this particular science fiction story, really playing with that tradition of um, time cop stories, and then playing with what science you're going to use to tell your time cop story. I like that. I like Jefferson's comment. It's really weird with folks traveling backwards while others go forward in normal time, so they intersect. Oh. Oh. definitely gets the noggin jogging oh oh so that oh so in tenet people are going in different directions at once oh so it's like the hurly burly of time travel stories right because you have everyone doing that you know i think again that's very much a trend that we see right now i just finished um a few months ago annalee newitz's uh history of another future of another timeline and it's and um, it's the same thing where people are traveling back and forth in time. And um, not only do you have like people officially and unofficially, so wait, so you have people officially traveling multiple directions in time, but you also have multiple groups. So you have people unofficially traveling and like, you know, so it gets, you never know like 
what side anyone's on and what direction they're going on. It gets very, very complicated. Huh. So I think uh, that that seems where people really, it's that, that it's complicated strain. So maybe that uh, it sounds like Tenet also fits into the it's complicated strain of storytelling. I'm curious about that first one you talked about in your presentation the, from India. Right. What was the plot of that story? Was that mainly a love story or? Um, the King Kakudmi story? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So what happens in the Mahabharata is the uh, king is looking for, he has like the most beautiful daughter on earth and he's looking for the most perfect husband for her. And no human man really holds up. So he's like, hmm, I don't know. We got to go talk to Lord Buddha about this um, or Lord Brahmin rather, sorry. And then they go to the heavens and I don't know how they get there, but they get up there and Lord Brahmin's like, I see you. I know you got a question, but we're in the middle of this really great musical concert. So why don't you sit down, listen to the music with us and then we'll have a chat. So the musical concert gets finished up in a few hours. And then, uh, so the King Kakudmi pre presents his problem and he says, I have this really beautiful daughter. I don't know who I'm gonna marry her to. All the men sort of seem equally good, equally bad. I can't make a decision. And Brahma says, oh, well, I'm gonna send you back to earth and trust me, your problem is solved. And sends him back and it's 500 years later and the problem is solved because all the other suitors are dead and someone else is running the kingdom. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, but fortunately then he learns his lesson and then he's reinstalled as king. And uh, I think Lord Brahma gives his son to, uh, uh, to marry the beautiful daughter. Huh? So it all ends well, the king learns his lesson. <laughs> Okay, we have a uh, comment from Cass. You want to just unmute Ooh, yourself, yeah. Cass? Oh, here, I can read it. Oh, go ahead, Cass, please. <laughs> I was just, I'm studying history right now. So I was reading about early America and all that culture with everything changing so fast. Mm. And it talked about Rip Van Winkle uh, as yeah. an expression of like, like everything's changing too fast. I don't know if I can keep up kind of thing. Right. I just thought it'd be interesting to look at more sci-fi through that kind of lens. Just oh, working. yeah. And yeah. Isn't that what we're living through now? Mm. <laughs> when you talk about needing catharsis. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, no, go ahead. I, I, I was going to oh. say, um, I don't Go ahead. I did that. It just made me okay. think of the times we're living in now because things are changing so fast. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, I mean, we were in a moment too when a lot of our science fiction, I think, feels really uh, poignant to us, right? Again, because we are in a moment of such rapid change. So um, for instance, as my students know, if you haven't done it yet, the story, one of the stories uh, uh, that they're going to be reading for next week by Leslie Stone, and it's called A Letter of the 24th Century, um, it was written in 1929 and imagines a future where people have basically the internet. And she sort and she manages to extrapolate from radio and TV what's going on then and to really imagine that future. And um, the best thing is, students, this doesn't actually give away the story. You still need to read it because there's other things you need to know about it. And also, you all always miss this. But students go look for it. The reason they move to their online society and their whole world goes online, and it works out great for them, by the way. Uh, is because of pandemics and because of um, anxiety about um, spreading diseases and things like that. And that's what pushes them towards an online society. And they're happy? Yes. Being not they being are. face to face and... Yes, they are. They are. <laughs> and they're happy because, I mean, you can choose to be face to face, but they're happy because um, all of their scientists can work together and they've managed to like, eliminate every major disease and they've figured out the a way to make childbirth a pleasant and uh, noble and fun experience as opposed to uh, the complex and difficult experience <laughs> that, that it often is for people who give birth. Um, and they have time to work out global modes of education, right? I mean, we've only been really living online for a year, right? We have no idea what happens in the past of her society. We, they, they're 400 years in the future. We don't hear the details. We just know that they get there eventually. Um, and so I, I'd like to take heart that, that someone made it through the crazy move online. Uh, but I think it's fascinating, right? That she's extrapolating from the influenza pandemic um, of 18, 1918, which she had lived through. And in fact, Stone grew up in um, Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh was hit harder by the flu than almost any other city in America, in part because their uh, mayor refused to mask and allowed very large uh, holiday parades to happen all that summer. 
And it became super spreader event after super spreader event. And I've actually spoken with Leslie Stone's son and he's told me about that. And uh, he said that she's often spoke about that and how that influenced her thinking about the future and disease. And now we're totally off time travel. Sorry about that, everyone. And now we're, but utopia, time travel. Um, but it's a great story that does that expression of catharsis, cast that you're talking about. Um, I think that even movies, and maybe that's why movies like Bill and Ted and the comedies are so popular is they're super cathartic, right? They show us, you can screw up and you can try again. And maybe not everyone will hold it against you. And maybe you'll do a little better the next time. Is there a current book dealing with time travel that you would like to see made into a movie that hasn't been? Ooh, that's a great question. I would love to see Octavia Butler's Kindred made into a movie. Uh, I told you all a little bit about that one earlier. I think, um, and having seen it as a graphic novel, it's very clear that it could be very powerfully translated into a movie. And uh, the graphic novel, if you guys haven't ever seen it is, it's amazing. Uh, John Jennings' ability, the, the book is super claustrophobic in some ways because it's really about like the deep claustrophobic connections of history and the deep claustrophobic connections between black and white and male and female um, owner and enslaved. And um, he just does an amazing job expressing that visually. So now I kind of want to see it as a moving set of images. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would like to see made is again, the book I had just mentioned, Annalie Newitz's uh, Future of Another Timeline, which actually, although, and this is a story where it's um, on an alternate earth, where we have always had time travel. There's just something natural within the earth that allows us to travel through time. Um, and different groups of people have you've been able to manage and harness that more and less successfully. Um, but we're at a point where um, there are two groups struggling for control of the future. And it turns out that there are two John Barr points. One is the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973. And the other is the rise of the riot girl movement, our musical movement in the 1990s. And so it's a great story. Who doesn't want an inner, interdimensional, interracial, interspecies, time traveling, romance, action adventure, spy story that includes riot girl music, <laughs> right? I mean, yes, obviously. And in fact, what's especially cool about it is that in this alternate history, there's a band called Grape Ape. And they're pivotal to what's going to happen and which future will unfold. And for those of you who are interested, um, all of Annalie Newitz's friends got together and they actually formed the band Grape Ape and they did a video and you can go on YouTube. And it's the video is for the big song that the band sings. It's called what I, I can't remember what it's called, what I like about girls or what I like about you or what I, I like what I see. Um, but it's marvelous. Um, and uh, Annalie Newitz's partner, Charlie Jane Anders actually does a turn in it. She's the bartender. And it's really fun. Um, and everyone is clearly having a really great time. So how, what's not to like about a book that already has its own video? And once I've seen the video, now I need the whole thing turned into a movie for me. Yeah. Carlos says, another great deco. This is how you lose the time war by Amal yes. Mokar. Max yes. Stone. Oh, that is such a great story, Carlos. Thank you for reminding everyone about that one, right? And that one, didn't that win either a Hugo or a Nebula? I believe it was certainly nominated if it didn't win, but that's a fantastic story. And again, this is about two time agents, right? If I, I, I haven't read it yet, but I understand it's about two time agents um, who do not have the same goals, but um, are working sort of at cross purposes throughout history and end up developing a relationship. Uh. I'm getting a lot of good feet. I'm yeah. opening up a new special room in our bookstore for, for time YA, travel. fantasy, science fiction, and I need to increase my stock. It won the Hugo. Oh, it yes. Thank you, Jivan. Amal El Motar. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. Amal El Motar is a review science fiction for the New York Times, which is really wonderful. Um, as a lot of you may or may, as you may or may not know, the New York Times has always reviewed science fiction, and it has often seemed to do so without any understanding of science fiction, historically <laughs> speaking. Um, and so it's been really nice in the last few years to see people like Amala Moltar and, um, and uh, Nanadi Okorafor 
uh, doing writing and review. And so people who are really in the genre and at the cutting edges of it and who know what's going on. So um, I think she's really wonderful. That's great. Yeah. Does yeah, anyone else know any good time travel stories? Yeah, everyone put in your time travel stories. Twelve Monkeys. Oh yeah, that's a good one, right? And that is, as you might know, based on a really famous short French film by Chris Marker called La Jetée. Um, so if you've never seen it, you should all go watch it. It's online. It's twenty minutes long. If you've taken my global science fiction class, you've already watched it. And if the you La haven't Jete taken it yet, you or the Twelve Monkeys. Oh, we watch La Jetée. Although we could watch Twelve Monkeys sometime. Stargate SG One. Season finale has the heroes live out 50 years in a time bubble that actually lasts seconds and kind of oh, cool. never happens. Oh, um, wow. Oh, I like that. <clears throat> what a great ending and so appropriate, right? Where like you get your fantasy ending and then the show ends. Um, so much better than a show where you don't get that. I kind of like that. <laughs> That's cool. You know, and um. Didn't Star Trek Next Generation end it with a time travel story as well? Um, and Picard had to go all around to like save humanity and like restart the earth. And he gets to go and witness the birth of the earth at the very end. Wow. Pretty good special effects for 1989, actually. I went back and looked at it, still looks good. Still looks pretty good. All right, cool. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, if there are no more questions, I want to thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing oh. your time and insight with us today. And thanks to all of you who posed questions and uh, added to the discussion. I, I think that's about all we have time for. Uh, remember, I'm going to be providing links both to this recording and to order her books in a follow-up email that will also include information on the book launch for Girl One and on uh, the June 22nd panel discussion of Afrofuturism in 21st century Black science fiction. It was a pleasure. Goodbye to all of you. Stay safe. And oh, somebody just came back in, Carlos. Joining. <laughs> anyway, we're just about to wrap up. So to stay safe, everyone. And I hope you'll join us for the book launch. If not that, the Afrofuturism panel discussion. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you.